Everyone's like this. False. It's okay, man. I tried to be cool. I tried to preach from the phone once. The problem is it keeps going up. So you're reading it, and then God's word goes dim, and then it goes dark. So I just have to stick to the old school. And I got a brand new Bible for Sensei Chapel preaching. So I got to break this bad boy in. We're going to be in John chapter 1. So if you can flip there, John chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, this is the verse we'll be up on the screen. If you don't have a Bible at all, next week I'm going to bring in a box of Bibles, the same translation I use, and you're free to steal one of those. Also, we have some lost and found Bibles, and you're always welcome to steal, because if someone doesn't love their Bible enough, you can grab one of theirs. Uh, maybe we get lucky, and it'll be your first name engraved on the front. <laughs> well, let's pray as we get into this. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son. Thank you that you sent him into this world to, to grab us, to save us, to transform us and change us. Be with us now, Lord. Speak to us. Break open our hard hearts. Break open my hard heart and my blind eyes to see your glory and to hear your voice this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So last week we were in Easter. We talked about Jesus dying and living under the banner of It Is Finished. And what that looks like, being free from having to earn God's approval because Jesus earned all the approval we will ever need. And, and last week, for all of you uh, pop culture nerds, I said we're going to Tarantino you, which just means we started with the end and now we're going to go back to the beginning. And we're going to look at what Jesus did to get to that end. So we're in John chapter 1. If you're in the Bible and you have a number before it, you're in the wrong book because there's John with no numbers and there's 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. We're not in those. We're in just John chapter 1. And as we get into this, you've got to know why John wrote this book. He wrote in his book at the end his purpose. These are written, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. But here's the problem. There's a, there's a problem with, with reading about a guy in a book that's 2,000 years old. And I call it the travel brochure problem. Have any of you guys ever traveled before? Okay, so here's how it starts. Uh, well, back in the 80s, it started with this thing called a travel brochure. For those of you guys who are under 30, that's a piece of paper with pictures in it that would tell you to go somewhere. Uh, if you're over that, you know that we get the travel zoo deals in, the, in your mailbox. If you want to get those sweet deals on last-minute cruises, I get them to torture myself every week. On Thursday, they come. I click through. I'm like, look at that. California, live there. Hawaii, live there. Florida, I, I live there now. I know I'm really suffering. But something happened this week, and, and it just reminded me of, of this problem that I've seen in, in Christianity over and over again, and that's the travel brochure version of Jesus. Because last week, as I was writing up uh, the, the sermon for, for this morning, I went to the beach, and I went down to Anna Maria Island, somewhere between Coquina and Siesta Key, for those of you who are local, I just pulled up a park, and it was spring break, I hadn't thought that through, so there was a lot of traffic. <laughs> And I park and I go to this beach, it's relatively not crowded because I got there around 10 in the morning or so, 10.30. And I'm sitting there, I put out my Pittsburgh Steelers beach towel on, I'm like, eat your heart out, Bucks fans. <laughs> and I lay down to get my crisp on. And as I'm there, all of a sudden people are coming around me. Like you can tell the Florida people because they look like leather. Uh, and they've just been walking up and down the beach for their whole life. But then all of a sudden, this family comes right next to me. And I heard them coming before I saw them. So I wasn't prejudging them much. Because they're coming down loud. I hear kids. I hear a couple of husbands before they even put down the coolers. They're like, break out the Bud Lights. And the mom goes, kids, go to the beach. You're only beach people for one more day. And I looked at these kids, man, they had zinked up. They had the, the neon pink board shorts with palm trees. And I thought to myself, these are not beach people. <laughs> they're saying that they're beach people, but they're not beach people. They're people who looked at a travel brochure, and now they've come to the beach to visit it, to experience it for the first time. But so often in church, we get stuck with travel brochure version of Jesus. We want to read all about him. We want to look at all the pictures. We want to Google and find out, oh, let's just do a Google Earth. Let's see where, where this beach is or that beach. Let me find out what's good. Where should I eat? And we figure out everything about Jesus, but we don't experience him. We hold back just enough of our life to ourselves so that we don't engage with the person of Jesus. And being a California native, growing up right by the beach, living in Hawaii, I've seen people and I've taken people to the ocean for the first time in their life. And if you've never done that, man, is it incredible. 
And in here in Florida, so I'm guessing you have, here's what it looks like. You bring someone from you know, the cornfields of Indiana, where all they've seen is ocean of corn. You say, here's the beach, you're welcome. And they stand and they're like, ah. Oh. And then they're like, can I touch the water? I'm like, yeah. And as they go in, they, they put their toe in, and I'm like, watch out for stingrays. And they go, what do I do? And I always tell them to do something funny. I say, well, you got to do this to keep the stingrays away. <laughs> All the way in the water. It's like, really? I'm like, really? They'll sting you. So they're like, okay. You know, they're, they're getting through. And then, then you have the people that go up to their waist. And they're like, wow, can I just swim? And I'm like, yeah, you can swim. Watch out for the tiger sharks. <laughs> I said, how do I keep tiger sharks away? I said, well, you swim like this. And you just keep going in like this. I don't think any other people do any ridiculous thing I can think of. But there's something different from seeing a picture, reading about it, to dipping your feet in, to swimming in the ocean. And there are so many, many, many Christians, hundreds and hundreds of Christians who grew up in church and and have had the experience of saying, look, we're going to learn about a guy today. And this is not a travel brochure. This is a person, a person with flesh and blood person with emotions, a person who walked this earth, a person who felt hunger, and this is this series' goal, is to get you to connect with that person beyond the travel brochure, beyond the stale paintings, but connect with the real man, Jesus Christ. So here we are, John chapter 1, he wrote this so that you may believe. And if you're a new believer, if you're visiting here today and you've never been to church, this is one of the loftiest passages in the Bible, and it might be confusing, but don't worry, we're going to unpack it. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Everyone say Word. Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. So check this out. We do this to new Christians all the time. If someone comes to Jesus, they're like, yeah, I'm pumped. What book in the Bible do I read? And what's the answer we always give them? John. So if you're a new believer like I was, you open up to John. And you're like, I'm so excited to learn about God. In the beginning was the Word. What's the Word? The Word was with God. God was a Word. And the Word was with God. And He was in the beginning. So if you're only two verses into this book, you're thinking, okay, there's a really old Word that's God. And all things were made through him. We find out that this is him. Without him was not anything made. It was made. So in the beginning was the word. Now we all have uh, some form of social media for the most part. Whether you're on Facebook. Anyone on Facebook here? Anyone on Instagram? Anyone on Twitter? Anyone on Snapchat? Sinners. Oh no. I'm just playing. We're awesome. We got this. One of the cool things that I've gotten to do since I've come to the chapel is get a lot of new Facebook friends. So I'll add people, they'll add me, I'll have 20 mutual friends, and one of them is someone I know and trust, I'll I'll accept their friend request. And and this last week I played a game. Because you can know somebody by what they look like. We can know God somewhat by looking around at creation. God is creative. God must like big things because he made a big universe and a big galaxy and big oceans and big mountain ranges. But you can only go so far by looking at pictures. So I actually did this with some of you this week. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to read any of their posts. I'm going to accept their friend requests and just start trolling through their pictures like a creep. So I started going through their pictures and I'm like, okay, this person loves their kids and food and wine. So if I learn anything about this person from their pictures, they love their kids, food, and wine. And some of you right here are thinking, you looked at my profile. No, it's just a generic one. It wasn't you. Don't feel guilty. It's okay. Jesus made wine. We're there next week. But when we can really know somebody is when they reveal themselves through their word. And here's where it gets lofty and confusing. Because we've heard of this thing called the Trinity. We call it the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And we think, okay, how does this work? There's three persons in one being. God, the Father. When He speaks, His his spoken word is so present and personal. It is the word of God. Before He was called Jesus, it was the word. And, And the word and the Father have such a relationship between them, we call that the Holy Spirit. The Spirit that binds everything together. And in the beginning of creation, we see all three of them in the first two verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word for God is Elohim, which already means God, plural. Right there, the first verse of the Bible. 
When God speaks, it's the word. And then the spirit hovers over the water. And when they say, let us make man in our image, it's not God talking to angels. It's God talking to the persons of the Trinity. And this is very important for later. Because this word is going to become flesh. And that makes a big difference for you and I. Now, if a Jewish person was reading this, they would have known exactly what John was doing. John was going back to the creation. This story is my favorite Christmas story. This is the original Christmas story. It's not the narrative of when Jesus came with his mom and the donkey in the inn. This is what God did in the beginning behind the scene of it all. Now, this word, this word of God became flesh. This word of God is a light that shines in the darkness. You guys know how light works, right? Okay, light reveals what's happening in reality. So, for example, um, people sin. I sin, you sin, we all sin. In high school, we sin in a very explicit way. And my friend and I, we were Jesus junkies. We were Bible thumpers. Literally on our Bibles, we got written our last name and thumper. So I have a Bible in my position that says Tyrona's Thumper. I was that guy. And we used to have parties at this house. And this house had the biggest speakers you could imagine, but it was a house of ill repute because we would turn off all the lights and they would get the music going. And I was fresh into Christianity, so like I didn't know the difference between like dancing and dancing like they teach you in youth group, right? Because the youth pastor would tell us like, oh, when you're going to those school dances, you've got to keep room for the Holy Spirit. And I'd be like, that's great. The Holy Spirit's in me. You know, get close. <laughs> So then I started telling the kids, I keep room for three study Bibles. You do that. But when the lights go off, and there's 15, 16, 17 year olds, and there's dancing music, whatever it was back then, Usher, all of a sudden, people are dancing close. This is like mostly people from the youth group. So youth group on one night, dance party on the other. But me and my friend Josh, we were rude and mean people. We would queue up and we would go to the light switches. And it's all dark, and people are dancing. This is before twerking was invented, so it was a different kind of dancing. And me and Josh, my best buddy, we'd go, one, two, three, and we'd flip on the lights in the midst of all this group of people trying to have sex with their clothes on. <laughs> and they did exactly what you would imagine them doing. As they're dancing, they're getting down, the lights go on, all of a sudden they're straight up and they're scattering like cockroaches. <laughs> well, when Jesus came into the world, the light that broke into the world did so to the sin in all of our lives. The light broke in and it showed us that we are worse than we think, that there's more darkness in us than we previously imagined. And some of us here might think, well, Ryan, now that I'm saved, light is through my whole life. That's just not the case. We all have areas of darkness in our life where God is graciously shining the light of Christ into them to expel the darkness, but we're going to get there. So here we go. Um, let's keep going. We're going to skip verse 6, 7, and 8. I apologize for that. But that's a little insert that John the author puts into there to talk about John the Baptist being a witness. And we want to focus in on the part about Jesus this morning. Verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own. His own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So here's what we know about the Word. Everyone say, Word. Word. He was light. light. He came. He came. People didn't take him. The Word of God was light, broke into the world, and His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. So let's recap real quick. We have Trinity. Everyone say, Father, Son, Spirit. Father, Son, Spirit. Creator God. Creator God. Three in one. Three in one. Sends the Son. Sends the Son. As the Word. As the Word. Word became flesh. Word, became Word is light. Word, is Word, Word light. gives life. Word gives life. Okay. Now, if you want light, I'm not talking about cheap, boring life. I'm talking about real, vibrant life. It is in Jesus Christ. I know what some of you are thinking, Ryan, I'm in church because someone made me come here. This does not feel like life to me. This feels like death. I would rather die. <laughs> but here's what we do. We try to scoop up life and all of these other things. We say, you know what? I know that my soul is made for something, so I'm going to try to get it up here in money. I'm going to try to scoop up life in relationships. I'm going to try to scoop up life in vacations. I'm going to try to scoop up life in whatever it is that you're looking for validation in. 
But God's right here saying, I broke into the world and I, I am the life. I am the life that your soul was made to have. And the saddest part of it all is that this loving God who created everything, who was transcendent above us, came into the world and the world did not receive him. The world did not believe him. The world did not embrace him. And when we say the world, we're talking about ourselves. We're not talking about people out there and then we're the people who got it all right. Because there are areas of every one of our lives where we're still rebelling, where we're still pushing back, where we're still saying to God, thank you, but not that part of my life. You can, you can handle my Sunday morning from 10 to 11.30, but God, you can't have my Monday. You can't have my Thursday night or my Friday night or my Saturday night. Because in those places, God, I want to be shrouded in darkness. And I just want a little bit of flashlight in my week so that I feel a little less guilty when I blow it up and I'm cursing at my spouse, my rebellion, my, my employer, or whatever it would be. So here we go. If you want life, all you have to do is this. Receive and believe. That's it. You receive Jesus, you believe. You don't earn it. You don't work hard for it. You receive and believe. I'm going to say that one more time. You don't earn it. You don't work hard for it. You receive and believe. Jesus says, here I am. Believe in me. And you say, okay, I've got nothing else to give you. I need you. I believe in you. I trust that you are the light that's breaking into the darkness of my heart. But this gets a little tough because of sin. We've talked about sin. We talked about sin last week. If you missed last week, I don't refer to sin as breaking the commandments. I refer to sin as Everything in us that is looking for approval, hope, satisfaction, and security in something other than Jesus. And God saw this problem. God saw the problem of how wicked we are. God saw the problem of our hearts wanting love from everything else in this world besides Him. So that's when God got radical and He gives us verse 14 of chapter 1. The Word became flesh. Flesh. And dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Feel mad? Do I feel real? Are you sure? Okay. Jesus is flesh and blood right now in this moment. If you and I were friends, you said, yeah, I'll be your friend, right? I'll start with being your friend on Facebook. Boom. I'll even follow you on Instagram. Boom. I will even Snapchat you. Boom. I'm a sinner. <laughs> We can be virtual friends. It'd be okay. Like, hey, I saw them. They checked in at this restaurant that I liked. This person's addicted to the Cuban sandwich. It's just like me. But then, if we got to hang out, we'd be closer friends. We share a meal together. We hang out together. Jesus came to be flesh, not so that we could treat him like a painting or a travel book brochure or a far-off image. Jesus came to be flesh and blood to relate to us, to connect with us. Because there's no way we could have made it to heaven. So he said, they can't make it up here, I'm going down there. And they had concocted this plan to send the Son of God to become flesh and blood. The same person who created everything is walking around as a five foot eight Jewish looking guy with three scars. Flesh and blood. Which is why I get so fired up when people treat Jesus like a painting. When people come to come here and they're thinking, well, you know, I just don't like singing the songs because, like, it's weird, man. It's weird to sing a song. And I get it. I'm a guy. It's weird to come into here and sit in the front row. And then when they sing these old school songs like Jesus, lover of my soul, I'm a six and a half foot man singing to a short Jewish guy saying, you're the lover of my soul. But once you get the reality of that he's a person, that it's just not some other guy, that it's a guy who gave up everything to come and find you, then you can sing. Once you realize it's a guy who became flesh and blood to take on human likeness so that he could relate to us, well, that changes a lot of things. And, and there's this word here that I love. And, and in English, it doesn't come across super great. But the word there in, in this verse it says, dwelt among us. The word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt. Everyone say, dwelt. Dwelt. Okay, everyone say, there's three lessons of the day. Eskinosin. Good job, Greek scholars. Now, this word, it, it should have been translated differently, but then it would have confused all of the American Christians. The word should have been translated tabernacle. Because there's a word for lived with, 
There's a word for, for came alongside. There's a word for came down to. But John uses a very specific word that says Jesus became flesh and he tabernacled among us. If you're a Christian, you know exactly where your mind is going. Tabernacle. I've heard about this somewhere. Wasn't there a guy named Moses? Yes, there was. And God had him set up the tabernacle. And what did he do with the tabernacle? He met God's presence. The tabernacle was the place where God would pour his presence down and later would get, be turned into the temple. The tabernacle was so thick with the presence of God that if you went in without being made right, you would die. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's, there's a robe that the priests would wear, and at one point in history they put bells on the robe with pomegranates and tassels in between, and they attached a rope to the dude's leg in case he died, because no one's going in after him. Because they would die. So this guy, I mean, imagine, you're going to go stand before God. Okay, guys, suit me up. Putting on your Iron Man costume, the bells, you'd be kind of freaking out, like, did I do all my sacrifices right? And you know it gets real when they attach a rope to your leg to drag you out if you drop. I mean, you're going into the, that holy of holies, and you're like, okay, hope it was a good one. <laughs> because if the bells jingled, and your, your friend the priest says, I heard the thud, Another one bites the dust. Mm -hmm. This is the tabernacle. God, in his glory in the Old Testament, could not be approached. When Moses said, God, show me your glory. We sing songs about the show me your glory. You know what God said? God said, Moses, if I show you my glory, you will die. So I'm going to make you a deal. I'm going to cover your face with my hand, however that works, and I'm going to pass by, and then I'm going to let you see the trail end of my glory. The trail end, like the shadow. It's when you're doing that thing, you move so fast, and you thought my hand was over there because I'm like a flash, but it's, it's over here. God did that with Moses. He said, boom, boom, leave a little trail, and you see it. And it says that when Moses came down from seeing the shadow of the backside of God's glory, his face was beaming so brightly that the people couldn't even look at Moses. That's how glorious God is. He's so glorious that if you saw the leftover entrails of his backside, your face would be bursting light so that the rest of us in here would say, I can't even look at you. Because God, when he came down to the tabernacle, his presence was made known. But because we could never approach God, he had to approach us. So when this, when this verse says, Jesus, the word became flesh and tabernacle, it's talking about God bringing his glory down in a way that we can finally step into it. Bringing his glory down into a way where he can finally press into it. Moses did not have this in his lifetime. Elijah did not have this in his lifetime. In the entire Old Testament, they were waiting and waiting because they knew God was glorious, but they could not be in the presence of God without mortal danger. So God came down and tabernacled among them. So here's, here's the reality today. Spirit, whatever. I've seen that, you know, the cross, this and that, Jesus, Spirit, whatever that looks like, the Holy Ghost. What does that have to do with today? What does it have to do with my life right now? What it has to do with your life beyond the lofty theology and philosophy is that this word became flesh, it became blood and veins and intestines and a mouth and a stomach. This word became our high priest. Do you know that the whole Old Testament priests were doing these sacrifices? I mean, if you've done a Bible reading plan, you've made it right to that part probably at least once or twice. I've never done this. I'd imagine some of you are farmers who killed animals here. I've never done that. I'd like to try it once. Not to be mean, I would, I would eat it. And uh, after someone taught me how to skin it or whatever, I'd do with that. But these priests would have this thing where they would say, okay, people, you've sinned. God, you're holy. Something has to die because your life has been forfeited. And they would kill an animal. Hold the head, slit the throat, blood come out. They would begin the sacrifice, burn some parts, cook some parts, sacrifice to God's work on Over and over and over again. The priest stood before the sinful people and the holy God. When Jesus became flesh, he ended that once and for all. He said, I am your priest. And I stand between you and God, once and for all. I became flesh so that I can do what you could not possibly do. I mean, we talked about this a little bit last week. The reality that Jesus never sinned 
He never loved anything more than he loved God. He never was distracted during a sermon by a kid's cough or, or somebody crying. or He never got bored uh, and, and fell away into some sin of laziness or slothfulness. He never stole anything. He never took anything that wasn't rightfully his. He never took credit uh, that was due to someone else. He did everything perfectly in the flesh. And sometimes we think this makes him untouchable, unreachable. But it did something drastically different. In Hebrews uh, chapter 4, we read this. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Jesus became our priest. Jesus was tempted like we are tempted. I know that seems trite because it's a Bible verse you've heard. But let me ask you this. Have you ever been hungry in your life? Just in dire need, desperate for food? So was Jesus. Fasted for 40 days. Felt hunger pains. The guy who could have looked at a rock and just said, Bread said, no, I'm going to be hungry because my people are going to go hungry. Have you ever had injustice? Anyone had anything unfair ever happen to them? Oh, me too. Jesus, the most perfect person in the world, had the greatest injustice of all committed against him. The most perfect person in the world was mocked, spit on, and accused of doing things that were the best intention things ever, the most righteous things ever. He had the greatest injustice of all accused against him. Anyone ever been betrayed? Betrayed. Could you imagine one of your best friends for three years? For three years coming up to you in a garden, and you knew all along this guy's going to betray me. You recruit the guy that's going to betray you. And at the end of it all, the moment comes where one of these guys who you've been eating with, sleeping with, partying with, playing pool with, hanging out with, comes up to you. And with a kiss, betrays you. A greeting of honor betrays you. Rabbi, betrayal. Man. So we have a priest now who's got hungry. We have a priest now who's had injustice. We have a priest now who's been betrayed. Have any of you guys ever felt broken down, beaten up by life? Right? Well, we don't have a priest who's far off. He's not somebody that's sitting on some high pulpit saying, Come on! Try harder! Be like me! And I, don't feel bad if you've said this before. I'm not picking on you. But so often I hear Christianity, we just got to be like Jesus. We just got to be like Jesus. We got to try harder to be like Jesus. You know what Jesus did? He died for the sins of the world because we can never be like Jesus. The goal of Christianity is not to come here and try. It's to receive and believe that Jesus did it all. And if you're saying, how does that make me better? Just receive and believe and you'll find out. Believe that he was killed for you. Believe that he was broken down for you. Believe that he was lonely. Just like the moments where you've been lonely. The moments where the world seems to fade away and you feel like there's nothing there for you. Those are the moments that we in the suburbs often deal with most. You know the reason we have noise so much in our life? We wake up in the morning to an alarm. We go on Facebook. We hop in the shower to music. We have a Bluetooth speaker in our shower head. We hop in our car on the radio. We go to work and there's the chatter and the music and the ambiance. You, you wonder why that is? Because in our heart of hearts, we all feel alone so often. And it is terrifying to sit under the pressure of the silence. Because in the midst of that silence, all of a sudden you realize how alone you really could be in a moment's notice. But the most lonely moment for a person in the world was when Jesus hung on the cross. When his friends betrayed him. And for that moment when God the Father turned his back on Jesus. So now when we come to God, we come to Jesus, we say, Jesus, I need your help. I'm lonely. I'm broken. I'm hungry. Do you understand? He says, I do. 
I'm there with you. I'm in the pain with you. When you're lonely, I've been lonely. When you're broken, I've been broken. When you're facing death, I face death. When cancer sweeps in, when a loved one dies, we don't have a priest who is sitting there in the heavens saying, just believe in this concept of me. We have a priest who came down in the grittiness of life and said, I faced it with you. I'm here with you and for you. So go to him. Counsel him. When you're broken down and lonely and in need, go to Jesus. Here's what I think some might be thinking right now. Ryan, I've gotten him a hundred times. I've, I've run to God. When I found out that, that my mother was passing away, when I found out that my spouse got cancer, when I found out that my kid was just running from God and being rebellious, Brian, I went to Jesus. I went to God and God did not listen. Well, you know what Jesus says in that moment? Brian, there was a moment where I went to God, my loving dad, and he didn't listen. There was a moment when Jesus cried in his face in the garden and said, Father, if there's any way, please take this cup from me. They did it. And Jesus hung on the cross. And in the midst of total injustice, total brokenness, and being as lonely as anyone could ever be, in that moment, God the Father turned his back at the Son. Not so that we would cry, not so that we would, we would just feel bad for Jesus, but so that now when Jesus enters into your life, he says this, I'm flesh and blood, and I've gone through it. I'm here for you and with you, no matter what you're going through. When the closest thing to your life shatters, I felt it. So come to me, and I will give you rest. Come to me, and I will be your friend when no one else will be. Come to me in the midst of your injustice, and I will show you grace and mercy. Come to me in the midst of feeling alone and isolated from God, and I will walk next to you step by step. You know the Footprints poem is so famous? I love that poem, but oftentimes it's not really accurate for my life. If you don't know it, there's footprints in the sand, two steps, God walking with someone else. And at the end of this guy's life, he looks back and sees times when there was one set of footprints. He said, God, those were the toughest times of my life. Where were you when I needed you? And the poem goes, well, it was in those moments that I carried you. And God is carrying some of you right now. You need it desperately. God has lifted you up. And Jesus is walking with you in his arms. For some of you, you've been in such a rebellion. God isn't carrying you. God swept you and dragged his dragon you. There's literally a set of footprints which are his and then a dragged butt print right next to it. <laughs> some of you need that today. Because some of you are thinking, Ryan, I feel not so hungry, justified, broken, and all that. I feel kind of good. Well, my prayer is I walked up and down this auditorium this week and touched every single seat. And I prayed for people. I said, God, carry those who need carry and drag those on their butts that need to be dragged. Because what we're not going to be at the end of our time together as we press into this. We're not going to be a church that thinks about Jesus as a stale, far-off painting. That's the irony of that sermon splash you're going to see every week, is that Jesus has been painted and photographed. We have white Jesus. We have mullet Jesus. We have Renaissance Jesus. We have black Jesus. We have Asian Jesus. We have every Jesus. Sometimes we get caught up and we forget that there's a real Jesus. We became flesh in our behalf. Go to him today with all your needs. He is more than enough. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you that you faced death and pressed through so that I have a priest who can stand alongside you and walk with me. I thank you that even though I grind and I fear in my loneliness that you stand next to me and you carry me and you drag me when I need to be dragged through the sand. God, I thank you that in the midst of the most broken times of our lives, in the midst of abuse, in the midst of betrayal, in the midst of sickness and illness, in the midst of the most 
heart-wrenching sins that you step into the midst with us. God, I know that in this group there are people who have lived their whole lives with you as a far-off painting. So I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would open their eyes to see the real person, to behold your glory, who came down because we could not go up, who made a way because we could not walk a path. Lord, save souls today. Bring questions to people's minds and don't let them walk out of here the same. God, help us to encounter your son today in a very real and tangible way. In Jesus' name.